he is calling for a presidential commission of inquiry into the operations of senior officers in the Guyana police force. Is the government concerned and would it consider having the COI conducted? Listen, Brutus is in deep trouble. I think Bruce Brutus is clever at building smoke screens. And that's all I'm going to say now. If he knew about all of this, this big upright officer, why did you wait until you got 240 charges to call for an inquiry now? You knew about all this wrongdoing all along. Why didn't you tell the president or the commissioner of police? You know, we have all of this wrongdoing going on now. I'm a big upright officer. You know, still, it's all going to play out in court. And he would have his day in court to justify how, how somebody could get, what, how many million in your account? 500 or 800 or something? Huh? 500 million in your account. You, I see the people who were who went to his wedding, thank God I didn't go. I think I received an invitation too, or else I would have been part of the lawsuit. Um, uh, uh, the people went to the wedding. So the thing is, I don't pay attention to this. He could have easily, if he has that, if he has all of this corruption that people engage in, release it to the public. That's what I said, release it to the public. Release it to, don't go worry, Commission of Inquiry. You know what they are? Go to the media. Give it to Kaicho News. Give it to any other news. Uh, do you tell us about the corruption? We, let's, let's hear. That's what I'm saying to him. Tell, tell the country about the corruption that you know. That's how transparency works. Oh, you want a Commission of Inquiry and all of that. No worry. Just release what you have. Since you know about it, and I, why didn't why didn't he call on them to all along to do this? If he knew about all of this that was going on, I don't waste my time too much to with these people. This morning, I met with the Attorney General and the leadership of the Guyana Police Force, and the meeting was geared are three fundamental issues. One is the accidents on our roadways. It is my belief that the traffic chief, well, the commissioner of police, must ensure that the traffic chief and his ranks are implementing to the fullest and maximum operability the laws governing the safe and proper use of our roadways. We cannot continue to have this type, this type of indiscipline on our roadways, especially with the trucks and truck drivers. So whilst we will hold truck drivers responsible, I have asked the Attorney General to examine the laws to see where there are gaps so that truck owners can also have the responsibility of ensuring their drivers work within guidelines. As it is now, the law provides for the suspension of license. And I've asked the traffic chief, commissioner of police, and the leadership of the Guyana Police Force to take immediate steps to have this law implemented fully. With all the speeding that is taking place on our roadways, only 18 suspensions this year does not speak to the magnitude of the issue we have on our roadways.
So truck drivers, drivers on the whole, but especially those truck drivers, public transportation drivers, I'm asking you not to do anything special. All I'm asking you to do in the interest of saving lives is comply with the law, comply with the rules. So I've asked also that the body cam we procured and are procuring for the Guyana Police Force traffic ranks especially, that those body cams be used in the execution of duties, traffic duties, so we can have video evidence and recording. I've asked that the cameras, the CCTV cameras, help us to identify these errant drivers, these lawless drivers, who obviously have no regards for their own lives, but put in danger the lives of others. As president today, I held this meeting to outline very clearly to the leadership of the guy and the police force who are also very concerned. Our severe concern about the present situation on our roadways. Secondly, on the issue of drinking under the influence of alcohol. We passed a law in which bar owners have a responsibility to relieve drivers of their keys and not to sell alcohol to drivers. I've asked the Guyana Police Force to also ensure that this law is enforced and implemented to the maximum. First of all, all bars must carry signage within the bars to effect this law. Today, the Guyana Police Force is once again going to send the wording for such signage that must be placed in every single bar across the country. The wording for the signage must be placed in every bar across the country. We're going to ask, I asked the AG earlier to see whether we can also amend the laws to have the license of bars suspended. The license of bars suspended if they're not complying with this regulation and this law. We cannot continue the carnage on our roads. We cannot continue the lawlessness on our roads. Thirdly, in keeping with the laws again and all the public notices and with our investment in technology as you know the hero Hi highway carries traffic cameras that is directly linked to the guyana police force and guyana revenue authority they, they have been issuing tickets how many speeding tickets we issued so far huh? on that highway on that highway alone the Heroes Highway, we have issued 893 tickets so far this year. They are now going to go through all the drivers, because this public notice was there, who continuously speed more than three times, and they will move in accordance with the law to have those licenses suspended. We have to take these actions to save you. We have to take these actions to save you from yourselves because you put your life at risk. And in putting your life at risk, we are also putting the life of others at risk. I am pleading with drivers to comply with the laws. Very soon, we will also be putting up speed advisory digital boards across different highways 
that would give you an indication as to the speed you're going at. I will ask now the Commissioner of Police to say a few words. Good morning, Excellency. Good morning, viewers. As the Commissioner of Police, we are tasked with the responsibility of ensuring the roads are clear in terms of carnage. We are still seeing a lot of uh, misrepresentation of driving, and we are still seeing carnages. And so, based on Your Excellency's uh, outright position this morning, we are going to double back, and we are going to put all the mechanisms in place. Drivers, you are going to see us. We are going to be working with you. And of course, who would have uh, made mistakes in terms of proceeding in excess of 100 on a new highway, and this is the heroes I refer to. You are going to be dealt with first, the truck drivers. We are going to be coming after you, we are going to be putting you in order, and in fact we are going to have um, retraining, we are going to have it redone. We have um, people went to the USC and they did the five days training. Immediately after um, this school weather would have concluded, we are going to do two weeks and we are going to add that as part of the curriculum. And so, uh, drivers will be dealing with you as of today, throughout the season, and throughout next year. That's it. These are necessary steps. These are necessary steps to avoid the abuse of our roadways. And as I said, to build public trust, the traffic ranks will have their body cams because that will be part of the process. This is a work together. And I'm pleading with commuters, if you are in a public transportation that is driving dangerously, that is putting you and other passengers' life at risk, you have a responsibility too. Please stop the bus, disembark, and report that bus. This is an effort that requires all of us to be responsible. That requires all of us to be responsible. The final issue that I've raised with the Commissioner today is in relation to the illegal use of sirens and uh, lights, emergency lights. If you have sirens and emergency lights illegally on your vehicle, I'm asking you to remove them immediately. I've asked the Attorney General to amend the laws with a fine and suspension of license for persons who are illegally using license and sirens. And for those security companies and others especially, who are granted permission for the use of lights. The law will also provide for the removal of those lights and suspensions of suspension of your security license if you're abusing those siren and lights. We are seeing tremendous abuse. I've also asked the police Commissioner of Police and his team to move immediately, to move immediately on all those shops, centers who are selling these illegal lights and sirens, all those who are installing these illegal lights and sirens. I've asked the Commissioner of Police also to have his team examine this. Because you too are part of the problem. So today, with the leadership of the Guyana Police Force and the traffic chief, I wanted to address this. We just concluded a meeting. The Attorney General was there. On these matters, 
because these matters are important to me, the government, the police, and more importantly, the people of our country. I'm hurt. I'm hurt for Carlton's family. You know, he is a Lindener, so he's somebody that I knew. And we have to have now a very honest and straightforward conversation about these trucks on our roads. I drive. Anybody who's a driver, frankly, any citizen that uses the road in Guyana could tell you about the terror that you feel as a driver, sometimes being sandwiched between um, these trucks, as a pedestrian having to hop into the corner because these trucks, these truck drivers believe that they alone have a right to use the road. So once you are operating on the road in Guyana, you understand the terror. You understand the terror of having to use the East Bank Corridor. He has received information that distribution of the $100,000 cash handout has commenced at several government agencies. We welcome this development. However, many public servants have contacted us to express their concern that they have been forced to have pictures of their identification cards taken by the personnel doing the distribution. They're also asked to say where they voted at the last election. Those who have refused to follow these instructions are being told that they would not get the handout. WPA notes that the government has repeatedly said that the only requirement for receiving this handout is the presentation of a valid identification card or a Guyana passport. The government must answer the following questions. Why these added requirements now? Why does the government want copies of ID cards? What does information about where someone voted at the last election have to do with receiving a cash handout? What is the linkage between elections and the cash handout? Why was there no public announcement that recipients would have to meet these added requirements? What does the government intend to do with the pictures of the ID cards and with information of where people voted at the last election? WPA can only conclude that its initial suspicions that there were hidden motives behind this initiative was not far-fetched. We have always been suspicious that voters, rather than all citizens, are being targeted for the handout. At a time when opposition parties are trying to get GCOM to address the issue of voter impersonation, and the governing party stoutly resisting any moves in this direction, the government's forced acquisition of people's ID cards is an ominous sign. Something sinister is afoot. It is not out of place to suggest that this exercise could be linked to an orchestrated effort by the ruling party to tamper with the elections long before 
election day. If this suggestion is proven to be correct, our country could be in for a rough ride in the lead up to the election. WPA therefore condemns in the strongest terms this latest development. We call on GCOM, local stakeholders and the international community to take note of this development. So first of all, let, so their point, let me make, let me tell you the contention first, that somehow we're using this to collect information so we could rig the elections. That is their contention again. We want to collect this information. Now, every bit of information that we collect here is already on GCOM official list of electors up to June. If you go online and it's also shared with a political party, they have a searchable copy. You can put in your name and you would see person, date of birth, address, everything. We don't have to ask, get, collect this information for election purposes. APNU has the very information we're collecting now, but we want it verified. So we want to make sure that this person comes, register, get a picture, and then you get their ID. So when we cut the check, and they come to collect the check, we give it to the right person, and the details, all the details are on the check that they will get, each person. So you have to go through this process. But it's not new information. So they said, oh, don't allow them to scan your QR code on your ID. So when you scan the QR code, guess what you get? You get exactly what's on what you can read on the ID card. You get the name of the person, the date of birth, the gender, and the ID number by scanning the QR, QR code. It's just easier. If you scan it, it goes, it populates the field faster than if you have to type in everything from manually. It's, but, but I don't think some of the people are technology savvy. So they, oh, they see a zombie here. The PVP wants to rig the elections because we are collecting data that's already in the public domain that they have. If we run a picture ID, so you know the person, but every GCOM presiding officer, when you go into the polling place, they have a folio, it's called a folio, with the voter, the voter's ID, a picture of the person there, next to the voter, voter um, name. And they have the gender, the, the, the date of birth, the address, everything. But suddenly they're saying to people, oh, don't give them or don't let them scan your, your ID ca card. That PPP wants to collect information to rig the elections. Every vote, it's, uh, it's such a stupid thing. But you know what will happen now? And, you know, if there's, the, there's people who follow them like cr the crazy ones, don't want to register, that's fine too. Don't come on because you think we collect any information to, to rig the elections. You just would not get your $100,000. If you want to be stupid, don't collect it. But trust me, all the MPs already, members of parliament, did already fill up everything to collect their 100000 But they would tell people, try to dissuade people by raising a boogeyman. They did this for scholarships too. They were telling people, don't apply to the gold scholarship. You never get a gold scholarship under the PPP. The large numbers, we don't ask who your, your affiliation, political affiliation, when we process the scholarship. They write off now. And by the way, last week I spoke about, or the week before I spoke about the sloth at UG, for a lot of the children, the, the people, not children, because some are elderly now, who have applied for the write-off and um, because they slowed there. So now the Ministry of Finance has put an online program 
you can apply online for the write-off of the student loan. So we hope to accelerate it and to make the process less burdensome. And um, so, and since I'm on it too, um, yeah, I, I asked the Ministry of Human Services to um, issue a release uh, so that those people who did not receive their pension books, there are about 3,000 for 2024 because of, you know, they had a fraud that the police is looking into now, that they have to be a little patient, they will get it, and that we're printing the, 20, the 2025 books now. Five men are playing games with our future and that great life we should be living with from that oil. A staggering 94% of the Guyanese surveyed want the oil contract renegotiated so that every citizen can enjoy the life of an oil rich nation. But when you observe their actions and listen to their words, it's crystal clear that's not what they want. They are content with that teaspoon arrangement with Exxon for the nation. After that survey, the demand for a referendum has resonated across this country. People are calling for a vote, one that allows every Guyanese above 18 to decide what they want from this oil contract and not what is thrown at them. And they also want that vote to come before 2025 elections. When this demand was put to each one of these leaders, they all tried their best to avoid this referendum, giving us that right, that voice, with that vote to decide what we want from our own oil. When Abri Norton was asked about the referendum, he said he does not oppose one, but then went on to say, the contract clearly allows for alterations, but only through negotiations with ExxonMobil. You hear that? He agrees that changes can be made to that contract. But what is he doing? Does Norton words sound like a man fighting to make any changes there? You tell me. <laughs> when the same question was posed to Nigel Hughes, he conveniently redirected that question to his party, Oil and Gas, spokesperson. The spokesperson mentioned that the AFC welcomes the referendum and has said before that the contract can be renegotiated. But why is Nigel Hughes, a lawyer and the leader of the AFC, avoiding the direct call for a referendum or a contract renegotiation? You reading through the lines? This is nothing but a political dance Nigel Hughes playing. Even the Attorney General of Guyana, Anil Nandalal, admitted that the contract can be altered with the agreement of both parties. So, why hasn't his government called Exxon to the table? <laughs> They all know change is possible, yet they choose to do nothing, nada, leaving the people to suffer while ExxonMobil collecting profits, pure profits. Now let's turn to Barra Jack Dale, the man fully in command of the oil sector. When asked about the referendum, he too, Acknowledge the issues surrounding bringing ExxonMobil to the table, but brushed it off, saying 
he'd rather deal with the matter after next year's general elections. You hear that? After elections. <laughs> he too admits that a referendum wouldn't be, if, be effective unless Exxon agrees to renegotiate. But what's stopping him from even trying? You guys see the game Jack Day on all play? His focus is clear. He wants your vote to keep him in power so he can continue defending that oil deal like he's doing ever since he took that chair. And as for our president, he cannot be rich for this question to be put to him. But by now, all Guyana knows where he too stands with this oil deal that can be changed. So there you have it, people. President Ali, Barajad Deo, Abri Norton, Anil Nandalal, and Nigel Hughes all admit the contract can be changed. So the question is, why aren't they making a move, calling Exxon to the table so that they can secure what is rightfully ours from that oil? Pia Modi says expansion of scholarships, provision of ferries among proposed areas of collaboration by Shamar Musa and Naomi Paris, eager to deepen diplomatic and economic ties with the Caribbean community. India, the world's largest democracy, is ready and willing to share its expertise and experience in areas such as agriculture and technology development. This is according to Prime Minister of India, Sri Narendra Modi, who made this disclosure as he addressed the second CARICOM India Summit which was held at the Guiana Marriott Hotel, coinciding with his three-day state visit to Guiana. During his address, the PM outlined several areas in which his country, one of the world's fastest growing economies, can aid the Caribbean. The most significant of these proposals Modi made is cooperation in the ocean economy and maritime security. President Dr. Irfan Ali addressing the second CARICOM India summit on Wednesday. The Prime Minister said that in order to enhance connectivity in the region, he proposed that India would supply passenger and cargo ferries to the region to aid in through regional connectivity. Together, he said India and the region can also work on maritime zoning. Promoting further regional connectivity has been one move that CARICOM has been working on for quite some time with studies to explore options for maritime services between several countries brought up. As the region moves towards its goals of achieving food security, Modi noted that another pillar of cooperation is agriculture and food security. With technology such as drones, digital farming mechanization and soil testing, the Prime Minister noted that India is transforming its agricultural sector and has even placed focus on nano-fertilizers and natural foods. To improve food security, he added that India is promoting millets, which are considered a superfood that can grow in any kind of climate. Against this backdrop, he posited that this can become an effective means of addressing climate change and food security for the CARICOM region. Additionally, he said that while sargassum seaweed is a big problem in the region that affects the hotel and tourism industry, India has developed technology to make fertilizer with seaweed. He expressed, this technology can not only help you to solve this problem, but can also increase crop yield. India is ready to share all these experiences with CARICOM countries. Visiting the Caribbean nation today, it is the final stop of his three nation tour. And the first time in more than 50 years that an Indian Prime Minister is visiting Guyana. His itinerary is packed. Prime Minister Modi will meet leaders from 15 Caribbean nations. He's also set to receive the top honours of Guyana and Barbados. It is a sign of India's deepening ties with the Caribbean. But why is this region becoming so important for India? Is this about India's growing need for oil and its push for energy security? Here's our report. Guyana was independent for just two years when Indira Gandhi visited this Caribbean country in 1968. It was a different era and Guyana was a different country then. Today it is witnessing an extraordinary economic boom. Just like India, Guyana is among the world's fastest growing economies. 
both countries want to leverage each other's strengths. Thanks to their strong historical and cultural ties, India and Guyana are ready to write a new chapter in this relationship. Guyana's president himself has an Indian connection. Irfan Ali's ancestors were among the first Indians to migrate to Guyana. He went all out to welcome the Indian Prime Minister. President Ali was at the airport to personally receive PM Modi along with over a dozen members of his cabinet and Prime Ministers of Grenada and Barbados. The Indian Prime Minister also received a special welcome from the PM Modi is also being awarded the top honours of Guyana and Barbados. The Indian community serves as a bridge between the two nations. About 40% of Guyana's population is either Indian or of South Asian origin. This has allowed India to develop a deep relationship, especially on the energy front. It is believed that Guyana has 11 billion barrels worth of oil reserves. This puts the Caribbean nation among the top 20 with the largest oil reserves globally and on par with countries like Norway, Brazil and Algeria. India imports around 80% of its crude needs. It needs diverse sources for crude and Guyana could be a stable option. ...of understanding on the area of health. So India is making strategic investments in Guyana. Earlier this year, both countries signed an agreement. It involves Indian companies like ONGC, which is India's state-owned and largest oil and gas company. They can get involved with Guyana's booming oil industry, participate in exploration, production and refining of crude. Similarly, India is investing in the defence forces of Guyana. Before Prime Minister Modi's arrival, Guyana commissioned two aircraft from India. These will be used to conduct aerial surveillance. New Delhi had extended a line of credit for these aircraft to Guyana. Energy and defence form the two main pillars of this relationship. Both leaders are expanding on these fronts with more bilateral agreements and greater cooperation. With this visit, India appears ready to expand its global footprint. Me. Mama drop the phone and run away. What you just say? No, bro. What you just say, intense? Bro. That is such an intense song. I don't know if you understand the gravity of the message in that song. How long did that song take you to write? What, were, what was your thought process in writing that song? Well, really, right, we really are going in today's society, you know. You get me even though I'm not going away or not, but we actually do a friend where you know, I get to and thing and, and can tell you what really I'm going. So things, those basically things that people can relate to and know, so yeah. You get me? Yeah. That's a very profound statement that you made. You said that you're not really going away. People would think that as an artist, you are in the streets a lot. How do you get the inspiration for your songs then? Only through third parties or watching films or reading? Yeah, watch show uh, and them thing. Uh, as I'm telling my friend them and thing and remember remember we no born big so obviously <laughs> You're big no bro, yeah, you're big. But, but you're we're huge. Born, <laughs> we're not born big, but so obviously from growing up till them time uh, you get what I say? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so we just tell a storyline along the way. Now, what is next for you? You're here for this big show, All Black, and I know it's going to be insane. It's going to be intense. There's no doubt about that. Because when you get there and you, you see the crowd energy, I know that I got fuel you with whole heap of excitement. What is next for you? Are you working on an album? Uh, are you going on tour? Talk to us. Yeah, I have a couple of shows for the above. I have Antigua, I have Trinidad, I have Bahamas. We have England for go. I will make more sure in process. I will even have an album, an upcoming album, Voyage. Okay. Yeah. When is that coming out? And how concrete. many tracks are we looking at? Probably about 15. But like you and she, 
I go definitely depend it. Okay. But when a concrete or solid date it over, say that date it a good job. Yeah, but very soon. All right. So I, you know, one of the things I know is a lot of people like to criticize young artists, but I try not to do that because you have to come into your own. A lot of people, you know, like even like you saying bold. Remember his first Olympics? Everybody did have big dreams for him, and then him pull up, and people say all kind of something. It takes a while to get to a particular level. What kind of what kind of preparation do you put into getting ready for your performances? Let's talk about that. Well, me rehearse, you know. How often do you rehearse and how long do you rehearse? Well, me just rehearse and rehearse and rehearse to catch what we really want to do. You get me? But it didn't really take. My dance probably about uh, two to three hours. Yeah. Uh, two to three hours? Yeah. Okay, you're definitely not a one minute man. All right, so big man. You know, I said, <laughs> take about two to three hours to get the lineup right. I know, say, when I said this, the DJ knows say, I dad for come next. You get what I say? All right. Yeah. Well, you heard it here from the big man, Intense. He's here for all black and he's going to be in Burbies. If you haven't yet got your tickets, go out and get your tickets.